Welcome to the Psychology Club podcast, brought to you by Vicente Martinez High School. Welcome to the Psychology Club podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Randy Collin, a psychologist who worked at San Quentin Prison for four years. Today we'll be discussing mental health in prisons. Our first question is, what mental health issue did you deal with the most? All right. Uh, well, thank you guys for having me. Before we jump into the, uh, the answers here, I really um, happy to be here and answer your questions and, and you know, appreciate your interest in, in helping prisoners and those incarcerated uh, with mental health issues. Um, all right, so what mental health issue did I deal with the most? Uh, most often it was just anxiety, just people um, coming into prison for the first time, uh, you know, no one knows what to expect, right? Like you have no idea what's going on and, and a lot of people are just really nervous, especially um, first time offenders. Uh, I've met with a lot of people who've been there, you know, a couple times and they may have uh, a better idea of what's going on, but um, anxiety was the biggest one. Um, but as a prison psychologist, I dealt with a range of, of mental health issues all the way from, you know, let's say depression, severe depression, severe anxiety, to schizophrenia, more psychotic based uh, mental health issues. Um, so uh, prison psychology is, is a great fishbowl for, for mental health. Like you see everything you're going to see in the real world and it's amplified and a hundred times worse. So. Uh, what are the conditions of the psych ward like compared to the normal prisoner cell blocks? Uh, that's a really good question as well. Um, the prisoner psych ward. So there's a couple different levels uh, when we talk about like a, a prison psych ward. Um, there's an immediate acute area that if somebody is threatening suicide, they're taken into um, a locked unit um, where there may be like, you know, five to six beds, um, you know, depending on the acuity or the severity of the suicidal thought, the belief, uh, there might be um, a truly padded room with, with like mats, you know, attached to the walls and and there will be a steel bed with a, a mattress, a very thin mattress. You're not allowed any laces of any type, like your shoelaces are taken away, there's no belts, there's no metal, there's no loose objects, there's no nothing. Um, so it's truly a padded wall, a padded room, where your your cell block, your prison cell is, you know, it could be four inmates in a prison cell, there could be a top bunk, you know, bottom bunk, and, and each person on, on a bunk. So. Uh, a cell block, very crowded. You have, you know, your your everyday, you know, you have your water bottle, you have your your water, you have your toilet, you have your food. Um, where a a psych ward is very very protected, very safe, um, and and it can be very isolating. So. And you worked in both women's and men's prisons. I did. I worked in. I I would visit uh, women's prisons and men's prison. I. I I, I was working within the, the prison system, California Department of Corrections, uh, for 14 years. And I think when I was in working with the system, um, there was 34 prisons in California. And I think I've been to like 17 of them. Okay. Um, and I've been to two women's prisons. Well, yeah. did you see any differences between men and women's men's well? Yeah, actually the women's prisons, the, the grounds were much cleaner. And much neater, um, but uh, I think some of the differences uh, you could feel it in the prison itself. Like you walk through the yard; the yard is the large area that people kind of walk through, and the prisoners kind of congregate, or the inmates congregate, and they do their thing. They're working out, they're running on the track, or they're just socializing but there's in a male prison there's just a lot of testosterone everybody's like 
on their game, like because you know something could happen at any moment. Whereas in a women's prison, it's not to say that violence doesn't happen. Like people don't get attacked. It just it's just it's it's a different vibe. It's it's very different um, walking around a men's prison than it is a women's prison. It's just less intense. Um, when you look at incarceration. When you look at incarceration, how does isolation impact mental health? Yeah, I, I think uh, that's one of the, the biggest factors that, that really does impact mental health in the prison um, is isolation. And it's used as a weapon in some way where if you act out, if you get in a fight, if you confront an officer, confront a civilian in the prison, um, the punishment will be isolation. You'll go to the ad seg, administrative segregation department. Um, you will have a single cell. Uh, it'll consist of a small window. There'll be a slot at the bottom of the door for your food. Um, and that's it. You're, you're cut off from the rest of the community for 23 hours. You may have an hour outside of your cell block. Um, and you and you'll go into a cage and you can walk around you can do push-ups in there you could do your own thing but but it you're basically cut off from the rest of the prison population for 23 hours at a time and it's really isolating it just really it could work on you it, it could you know degrade your 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 mindset right it's it's a horrible way of being it just there's no social contact at all um whereas uh, in, you know, the general population, like, you know, prisons are overcrowded. Like there, there is no long time. It's like, you know, you're, you're just with people, you're social, you're out there, um, you're engaging with others or you're just trying to find your way. Um, yeah, but isolation is, is kind of used as a weapon and, a, and as a punishment in prison. And they're trying to do away with it in some prisons, but so it's still used. <laughs> what is the worst <clears throat> mental state you've seen a uh, prisoner in? Uh, so as we were just talking about the isolation piece, uh, there is a building at San Quentin that when I was there, it was called the adjustment center. Like truly it had a sign on it said the adjustment center, like people go there to get adjusted, not their backs, their minds. Right? And so, um, there was an inmate and he was psychotic, very a mental, severely mentally ill inmate. He was schizophrenic. He stopped taking his medications and he was hallucinating, uh, hearing voices, seeing things, horrible state of mind. He was butt naked. Um, he had stopped eating, uh, for probably for like three or four days. He hadn't bathed in like a month. Um, and he would, uh, smear feces on the walls. And uh, so the officers came over to the psych department and um, I've been there the longest. So I got volunteered to try to help get this inmate out of his cell. Um, it was a horrible experience. I would knock on a cell and he'd just start swearing at me for like 30 seconds. Like he would just swear, right? you know, and then... Uh, if so, I was not successful in getting him out of his his cell. Uh, there was like a group of then like six officers stormed the cell um, with riot gear on, and they dragged him out of the cell. They they washed him up. They cleaned him up. They got him some meds, um, and then I don't know what happened to him after that. But that was probably the the worst. Uh, state mental health state that I've ever seen anybody. So, what are the some of the things they, they do in prison to help with the prisoners' mental states? Um, so, when I was working at California Department of Corrections, I, I was a contractor, and I last worked as a contractor for the Department of Corrections in 2020. Um, and at that time there were three levels of, of mental health care. There was a, uh, an intensive program where people would meet in groups 
there would be topics like psychoeducational groups, like how to function on the outside, like how to take care of yourself, how to take care of your mental health. However, it's like we are sitting here around this table. Just imagine you were then put into a, a steel cage, right? And you guys wouldn't be able to sit next to each other. You'd have the cage and it's a, a grate, like a steel grate. So we could see each other. You just can't touch each other. So the groups are a great idea. Um, the steel cages, not so much, but they're also protective. And that, you know, if somebody in the group gets a little aggressive, gets a little upset or, or you know, something that you can't really harm each other. Um, so that was, you know, some of the groups. And, and that depended on was there room available for mental health treatment in the prison, right? It all, it all varied prison to prison. Um, sometimes there were, there were actual rooms set aside for, for inmates where you can run a mental health group and talk about you know whatever came up um, in the group. A lot of the times, as a psychologist, I would actually have to go cell front to the the inmate's cell front. So you would be in a cell. I would come up to you. I'd have my uh, my Kevlar vest on. I'd probably have a helmet with a face mask on, um, so you didn't spit on me. Um, and then you couldn't stab me through the cell block. Um, so, and then I would talk to you and I'd ask you a bunch of mental health questions in front of your celly and the guy next door to you and the guy next door to you on that side. So privacy wasn't a really big thing. Um, you know, you had the option to come out of your cell, but a lot of times people didn't want to come out of their cell. Um, I used to work in... Uh, the administrative segregation unit at San Quentin. I also worked on death row. So I would go cell front to people that were on death row who were on men and receiving mental health treatment. And uh, I would talk to them as well. And if they were out of their cell, they would be handcuffed, uh, you know, handcuffed here. And then their, their feet would be shackled to the ground as well. They'd have feet, you know, uh, cuffs on their feet. So, um, yeah, so it was individual, cell front, individual in a, in a private setting. You know, there was big group settings where we try to do it in a, in a group room or we do groups out in the community, like, but you'd be in a, in a box. Um, there were also times when I would do interviews where there'd be like a, just a glass wall between us and there'd be like a speaker and I'd speak to and they'd you know, be able to talk to me, but... They weren't handcuffed at that point. They would just be in a, in a separate room and we just look at each other and talk, like kind of like you see in the movies. So stuff like that. And if you can make any changes, uh, if you make changes from the justice system, what changes mm -hmm. would you make after working with San Quentin? Um, I think, you know, it, it's something, it's a huge issue throughout the state of California and, and the rest of the country is, you know, this just, overcrowding like the prisons are just so crowded and i know there's actually been a movement to reduce the number of prisoners in the california department of corrections and i think they're being successful with that um so so that's a big thing right the overcrowding and you know some of the facilities are just way 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 too old like san quentin was built um san quentin was built by people who had been incarcerated after the gold rush in 1849. So there's a sign on San Quentin. I think it says like it was built in like 1851. Like it is just super, super old, you know, and just, it's kind of run down a little bit. There's a new medical facility that was built, um, you know, within, I don't know, I think like 2005. Um, so yeah, so overcrowding is a big one, you know, updating the facilities. Um, Trying to separate the mental health population from the general population is an issue as well. And believe it or not, like people try to sneak in to the mental health population because they feel that they're treated better. They're brought out of their cells. They could talk to somebody one on one. Like it gets them out of the just the, the kind of, you know, day to day hustle of uh, being in general population. So you got to screen for that. That was part of our job.
as well to screening inmates to see who really qualifies for mental health versus those who don't. Um, so, yeah, so overcrowding is the biggest one for sure. When you look at St. Quentin, who was the most like famous by St. Quentin standards when you were there? All right, well, so I would say infamous, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, so I worked at St. Quentin uh, two separate times. I worked there from 2001 to 2003, I think it was, and then 2008 to 2010. Um, and during that time, my first go around, uh, if I don't know if you get you guys are young, but if you ever heard of Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, he was there, um, and he was on death row, and then he died at San Quentin as well. Um, so he was probably the most infamous person I was there, who was there when I was there, and also uh, Richard Allen Davis, Polly Class, a, a sexual assault, child abduction uh, happened. I don't know in the in the eighties or the nineties. Um, he was there as well. He was on death row, and I could talk about these people because they were not in the mental health program. So, um, and then my last go around in two thousand eight, two thousand ten, Scott Peterson mm -hmm. is there, um, and he's still there. Um, he's on death row, um, and this is all public information anyway. So, but but those are the people that you know are most have the most notoriety, I guess, mm -hmm. at, at St. Quentin right now, so. Um, thank you for watching, and thank you, Randy, for joining us on another episode of the Psychology Podcast.